With all that's been happening around the pandemic and about the protests in our streets in America and in Europe, and more recently with the spectacle of an American president using police state tactics to appropriate an Episcopal church for a staged photograph, I thought it was important to let those who are closer to these events and more qualified than I am speak to them. There's little doubt in my mind that one of the besetting problems of our age is the tendency of white straight men to believe they have the qualifications and the privilege to speak to any topic in the news. But this week has been different. It demands a different kind of message, and I have concluded that the time has come for me to speak to you about these matters. As faithful people gathered in our churches across Europe, churches that trace their history to American beginnings. I want to speak with you about three things. About the protests that have been taking place in the United States and Europe, and about the spiritual aspects of the evil that created the conditions for them to happen. About the incident on Monday last of President Trump and his trip across Pennsylvania Avenue to St. John's Episcopal Church and about what we must do and what we must not do as Christian people in the face of all of this. As the protests over the killing of George Floyd have escalated, as they have brought back into view the killing of Michael Brown in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, or Tamir Rice in Cleveland, or Laquan McDonald in Chicago, Tony Robinson in Madison, or Eric Harris in Tulsa, Walter Scott in North Charleston, Philando Castile in Minnesota, Freddie Gray in Baltimore, Botham Jean in Dallas, or Breonna Taylor in Louisville, or countless others who make up the fact that black people in America are 250% more likely to die when they come in contact with the police than white people are. We hear all of this spoken of as evidence of the enduring sin of racism in our society. That is true, but it is not the whole truth. Racism is not an American sin. The grievances that have given rise to the mounting protests come about because of the uniquely American expression of a human sin. Yes, race has meant something different in European history, but it is equally present here and equally powerful if differently expressed. But here is more of that truth. Racism is just a modern expression of a truth as old as humanity about the crooked timber we are made of and that scripture speaks to clearly. You will not find the categories of race familiar to us in the account of the Bible. But you will find from the beginning to the end of the Bible's narrative the deep human tendency to make profound meaning from differences between us to imagine that those differences somehow define character. And we do this for a very simple reason, because wherever humans can make difference, they will find a way to grasp for power. And that is why we defend these fictions of ours, even if it means killing others to preserve our fictions. That is a universal human failing. As uncomfortable as we get when it comes to talking about human fallenness, this is exactly the modern proof of it. Our insistence throughout our whole history on inventing meaning from differences between Jews and Samaritans and Greeks, between slave and free, men and women, clean and unclean, we keep imagining these differences we observe mean something or we create differences of our own. And that failure of imagination is exactly what we mean when we talk about original sin. We have to treat white supremacy like any other sin. We have to repent of it. We have to recognize the damage to human lives and dignity that it has caused. We have to be reconciled with those we have harmed, whether or not it was our purpose or design. And we have to make an intentional commitment 
to change our lives, to be better at avoiding falling into that trap of making meaning out of difference. I have spent hours this week trying to understand why the spectacle of the President of the United States standing in front of the boarded up parish house of St. John's Church in Lafayette Square was so deeply distressing to me and why it was so encouraging to others. We are not a perfect church, not by any means, even especially on the injustice of racism that has brought protesters out into the streets. Our church on that subject has an uneven record. Since the day I took this office, I have not forgotten that when Martin Luther King Jr. wrote the letter from the Birmingham jail to eight white clergymen in Birmingham, Alabama, who wanted him to pack up and go back to Georgia, two of the eight that he was writing to were my predecessors as bishops of the Episcopal Church. We have much to answer for and much to repent for, and by God's grace, we have begun that work. Two things are most disordered about that picture from Washington and what brought it about. The first is the conflict between what happens in that church or in any church and what happened that day in front of it. A church is a place where people bring their whole lives, their joys and their sorrows, their victories and their failings, their lives and their death, to find some place for God in all of that. It is a place where people seek and find the possibility of the sacred in their lives. Not the only place, but a good place to look. And most importantly, a place that vows to protect the sanctity of those moments. No one, no matter how powerful, no one has the right to violate all the bound up human life that a church holds. No one has the privilege to use the church for their own purposes, no matter how noble they might be. And no one has the authority to make us stand for something we do not, or to use whatever reputation we have to confer without our consent. But more than that, no one should have the right to use violence against people who gather at the threshold of a church seeking safety and shelter. Let me say this as directly as I can. Using violence against people gathered on the doorstep of a church is an act worthy only of cowards. And we are stronger than cowards because love is stronger than fear. We in Europe see this momentary event through the lens of centuries of tangled history in the relationship between the church and the power of the state. We know in our bones the deep dangers that threaten the witness and work of God's church when it becomes a tool of kings and Caesars. And we know the truth of Barbara Brown Taylor's wisdom that Jesus was not killed by atheism and anarchy. He was killed by law and order allied with religion. We know that, and the histories of our various nations have lived it. And we offer back to the rest of the church a warning about what can be lost if that line is crossed. So I've decided to conclude this message to you sitting on our own doorstep at the gate of the cathedral in Paris. And I want to say what we must do and what we must not do. First and most important, we must not despair. Even after the sorrow of being isolated from each other in lockdowns, even after the distress we feel over the violence in our streets or the deep dismay we may feel at what seems like the victory of the strong over the weak, and of decline over renewal, we must not despair. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Despair is. And despair is where the devil lives. 
we must and we can resist that past. Instead, what we must do, even if it seems paradoxical, is to build. We must press on toward the hope God has set before us. And we must continue now more than ever to do all that we can to share the richness, the fullness, the joy of life connected to God that we have found here. This is not the first time the church has confronted distress and degradation. It surely will not be the last until Jesus comes. But we have been here before, and what the best among us did when things were hard was to build. In the middle of the English Civil War, when it seemed as though social order had completely broken down and tremendous battles were being fought over the place of the church in society, one man, Robert Shirley, decided that despite it all, he would build a church for the Church of England. He built another place named for the Trinity, just like this cathedral, the Chapel of the Holy Trinity in Staunton Herald, Leicestershire. He did not live long enough to see the church finished, but he made certain that it would be. And over the door of that church is a tablet with these words. In the year 1653, when all things sacred were throughout the nation, either demolished or profaned, Sir Robert Shirley founded this church, whose singular praise it is to have done the best things in the worst times and hoped them in the most calamitous. So let us not cease to be builders. Let us resolve to be those who do the best things in the worst times. And let us hope, even in the face of calamity, in the sure and certain conviction that God's work will be done.